led you to himself. Praise God for that day. I want you to go on a brief journey with me to the day that Christ died on Calvary's cross. I want you to imagine you're one of the disciples who had been following Jesus for three years, seeing him perform all these miracles, attesting to them and to everyone that he is the Lord, that he is Messiah. With expectations, many of the disciples, if not all, expected him to be this Messiah that was going to come and was going to set up his earthly kingdom then and, 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 and bring victory over Rome, who was oppressing Israel at the time. And I want you to go with me to that day when Jesus was crucified and handed over to, handed over to the Romans and crucified. The despair, confusion, uh, fear of the Romans that the disciples had apparently, as scripture said, they went after that and were locked behind closed doors for fear. They thought that they maybe as followers of Jesus were gonna be next. And then you get news that Sunday, Jesus died on a Friday, and you get news that Sunday that he is risen from the dead and he is alive and they're like, what? But then they see him and he's alive. They're filled with joy. They're filled with worship. And then for 40 days, 40 days, Jesus is with them on the earth. And during this time, at various times, Jesus is teaching them about how the Old Testament scriptures uh, 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 were, were really telling about him and what he's going to do. And, and they all finally just kind of get it and understand it. And during that time, at some point, Jesus says, hey, guys, hey, girls, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. He says, you, you're to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, making disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On another occasion, before he ascended back up into heaven after, the, after those 40 days, right before he did so, he said, you, he looked at them, the believers, and he was like, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And then he ascended into heaven. And then they waited. They waited for the promised Holy Spirit to come. And there at Pentecost, remember, Acts chapter 2, on Pentecost the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the apostles to preach in languages that are not their own to where all that had come to Jerusalem for the feast could hear the gospel proclaimed in their language. And 3,000 that day get saved. The church has exploded. The followers of Jesus in Jerusalem had had, had, had grown exponentially by 3,000 in just one day. It continues to grow. And there's a guy named Stephen. Long story short, you can read his, his story in, in Acts uh, 7. But Stephen is a follower of Jesus. And the Jews didn't like him. They stoned him to death. And because of Stephen's death, the Bible says here in the beginning of chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul, we know Saul, Saul who was Paul who wrote uh, a lot of the New Testament, and Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day, the day that Stephen was executed, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. In verse 3, it says, Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
So I want you to imagine with me these believers who have gone through such despair and then victory, Jesus is alive and he's risen. And then they understand all the scriptures in light of who Jesus is. And then Jesus ascends to heaven and they know they have been commissioned to go share the gospel and make disciples of all nations. The Holy Spirit comes and allows them to do that and they start to see that happen in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, this incredible persecution starts to happen to the church in Jerusalem, and they're all scattered to, to Judea and Samaria. Verses 4 and 5. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. These early believers, despite, during, and because of likely persecution, went about preaching the word. Persecution chased these early believers from their home into Judea and Samaria. And as they went, they were consumed with the mission to make disciples and share the gospel. Notice what you don't see these early believers doing. As they were scattered because of persecution, they did not hunker down in fear to protect themselves, to protect their families, to prevent more persecution. No, wherever they went, what did they do? They preached the word. This word preached, by the way, is not just what I'm doing here. Preach really means share. It means, you know, you can do that over dinner. It's just when you're sharing the gospel with someone. Don't get scared of that word preach because you can't stand behind a pulpit. Preach means share the gospel. Even intense persecution and the issues that it created could not snuff out their love of the gospel and being consumed with the mission to make Jesus known. Think about it. You're uprooted from where you were and you had to go into another area. I'm just thinking, if that happened to me and my family... I've got to find a place to stay. I've got to find a place to provide for them and a way to provide for them. I've got to find food and, 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 and uh, water and just friendships and a job, just all that kind of stuff. Their lives were uprooted, but all that stuff did not replace. I'm sure they probably did all that, but it didn't replace their consuming passion with making Jesus known. Jesus and his glorious gospel was compelling enough to them to alter their life and define their purpose no matter what situation they were in. They, David Guzik says, talked about Jesus wherever they went, end quote. It's as if they said, if I've got to go and flee, I'll go as a missionary. So here's my question to you and to me. Is the gospel so valuable to you, the call to share it with the lost so central to you that you are willingly compelled to share it no matter what situation you are in. What does it take to distract you from sharing the gospel? Fear of persecution, maybe? Fear of being outed? Fear of being all of a sudden you're the Christian friend? You're the Christian coworker? Maybe other life focuses. I got this to do. I got, I got kids. I got grandkids. I got job. I got all this. I got da, 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 all this. And other life focuses just steal your consuming passion to share the gospel. Every single situation that we're in, even our struggles, are opportunities to proclaim Christ. I want you to think about this. Every situation, struggle, life, situation you're in is your pulpit. This was their pulpit. Persecution became their pulpit. You can imagine. They go into a new town. They're the new people in town. What you here for? Well, that question, their situation became their pulpit. Well, I was in Jerusalem, and I believed in Jesus. And they chased me out of town. Let me tell you about Jesus. Their situation became their pulpit. Your health situations can be your pulpit. It can be your opportunity to share the gospel. Maybe you're, you've got stuff going on physically in your life, but even through it all, you can say, no matter what happens to me physically on this earth, I know that Christ has saved me, and no matter what happens to this body, I know that because of what Jesus has done, I will get a new body one day and spend forever with him in it. Can I tell you about Jesus? 
Your health situation becomes your pulpit. Maybe your family's going through a situation. How you going? How you, how you, how you doing with that? It's, it's so hard. I see what your family's going through. Hey, it's hard. But God's good, and I have hope in him. Let me tell you why I have hope in Jesus. Because of what he's done. You see, every life situation we go through can be your pulpit. These believers, their persecution led to the salvation and joy of lost people. If you jump down in this chapter to verse 8, Philip, as a result of this persecution, goes to Samaria. And in verse 8, after he has proclaimed Christ to them and all, that he's, all the work that he's done there, it says, so there was much joy in that city. We know that some of these people in that city believed in the gospel. Verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So when Philip, because of this persecution, goes down to Samaria, he pr proclaims Christ to them. They get baptized. They get saved. They see signs and wonders done through Philip, and there's great joy in that city. And their persecution led to the salvation and joy of lost people in Samaria. And it fulfilled God's great commission. He said, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And guess what? Persecution chased Philip to Samaria, and his great commission is being fulfilled. Harry Ironside says this, Many were hearing the gospel who might otherwise have been left in ignorance of it. End quote. Because of the persecution, people were getting saved. So, God just may allow certain situations in your life, some even hard in your life, to rearrange your life, short-term, maybe long-term, to get you to specific places with specific people whom he wants you to share the gospel with. He's building his church, and he lets us be a part of it. So we rejoice. We fulfill our life's mission our main life's mission, which is the Great Commission to go make disciples. Our mission field is wherever we are with whomever we are with. Let me say that again. Our mission field, mission field is wherever we are with whomever we are with. I also want you to note who was doing the sharing of the gospel. It was ordinary believers. It wasn't the apostles. I mean, they did. But this particular account speaks of ordinary believers, not the apostles. Look at verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Listen. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem for some reason, but everybody else went scattering, preaching the word. It was the church. All believers were sharing the gospel. And Alexander McLaren says this, It is not every believer's duty to get into a pulpit, but it is his duty to preach Christ. End quote. You don't have to be professional clergy to share the gospel. You just need boldness. You need obedience. You need a love for Jesus and his gospel and the lost folks and a simple knowledge of the gospel by the way that you already have because you believed it when you got saved. Sharing the gospel is every believer's mission. It's our family mission to make him known. Our family value, you know, a lot of us in our families, we have family values this family's value is to know Jesus and make him known. I want you to notice, verse 5. This message of the gospel, these believers, they went to all people. Look at verse 5. Philip, uh, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Some versions say a city of Samaria. We don't know exactly what city it was, but Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. Notice where Philip went. He went to Samaria. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, biblical history and all that kind of stuff, Jews, of which most the early believers were, 
they did not like Samaritans. They despised Samaritans. Samaritans, long story short, were half-breeds. They were half-Jew and half Gentile Jews had intermarried and, and, and uh, had children with people who were not Jews. So it was mixed blood. So it wasn't pure blood. So they looked at them as probably even less than second class. They, they wouldn't even walk through Samaria. They thought the land that the Samaritans lived in was unclean. They did not like Samaritans. Samaritans didn't like them. They had different religious thoughts. They might have shared some similar thoughts about the one true God, but their religious thinking was different. John, when, when Jesus goes into Samaria and he sits down with a woman at the well in John chapter 4, great story, I encourage you to read it, but it says this, the Samaritan woman said to him, to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, because Jesus had asked her for something to drink. And then John puts in parentheses to fill us in, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They didn't have dealings with one another. They did not like one another. But again, by Jesus going and talking to this woman, he's already displayed a heart for Samaritans to know him. He, he, talked with the, he walked through Samaria, by the way. He talked with the Samaritan woman and offered her eternal life. And then when they asked Jesus to stay in Samaria for two days, he did. In Luke chapter 17... He healed a Samaritan leper. The Great Commission that, that we've already, I've already quoted, going to all nations, that includes Samaria. Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Judea and where? Samaria. The Great Commission affirms his desire for all nations to hear his gospel and be saved. So here, in our uh, text for today, we find Philip, who, by the way, is not the Apostle Philip. It's the deacon Philip and from Acts chapter 6. He's not one of the apostles. So here we find Philip taking the gospel, listen, across a cultural barrier, across an ethnic barrier, across a religious barrier that existed between Jews and Samaritans. So how does that land with us today? There is absolutely nobody that we should not seek to reach with the gospel. People, now, I know what I'm about to say, and I know this is going to preach pretty good, and you're probably going to do like this. But when it lands in your ears, and you can affirm it with your ears, it changes when it moves to our feet and we walk out of these doors. Why? Because we have barriers between people in this community and, and where we're at. And we let those social, cultural, ethnic, religious barriers keep us from them. There are people in this community that you're not naturally drawn to for whatever reason. People you may not be naturally drawn to and may not even like need the gospel of Jesus. In our community, there are those who you don't look like, you don't act like, who you don't have common preferences with. There are those in this community, maybe even close to you, maybe even in your family, that to some degree you are divided from. Society today is a society of division and disdain. We are being told directly or indirectly to despise other people. We are. And if you're not careful, Christian, that will happen to you as a believer. Worldly division and differences must not keep us from sharing the gospel with the lost. Everybody, wherever you are, is your mission field. And we need to go to where the lost are, no matter if they are people whom we have differences with. And as we go, what do we do? We share the gospel of Christ. We share the gospel of Christ. The believers, it says here, went about preaching the word. Philip proclaimed Christ in Samaria. We are to proclaim the word about Christ to the lost. We proclaim lots of things to other people. We're constantly proclaiming things to other people. What are you most known for proclaiming? Social media has done this for us. 
it has helped us identify what we most like to proclaim. Maybe before social media, you could kind of be hidden a little bit in what you like to proclaim. But now social media has identified what we like to proclaim because that's what we hit share, comment, post, send, whatever. What are you most known through your life for proclaiming? Is it your ideas about social issues, your ideas about politics? Is it your family and all the experiences you have or the meals you ate or cat memes? Kidding with Daniel over there. What are you most known for proclaiming? Christian, listen to me. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you. What people need for you to proclaim more than anything else is the gospel of Jesus. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. Paul says, this Paul who was ravaging the church ends up getting saved and becoming a missionary and he writes uh, making disciples of, of all nations and he writes a letter to the Romans and this is what he says in the, the, his letter to the Romans part of it verses 17 to 21 in chapter 5 he says for if because of one man's trespass he's speaking of Adam in the garden first two people Adam, Eve God said eat of any tree you want just don't eat of this tree Satan comes up, you know the story, some of you know the story, most of you know the story. Satan comes up and says, oh, God's holding out on you, you man. If you eat from that tree, he told you not to, you'll be like him and all that kind of stuff. So what does Adam and Eve do? But they eat from that tree and they sin. And because they sin, sin nature has come in them and now is in us and we are all prone to sin. Listen to what he says. For if because of one man's trespass, Adam, because of Adam's sin... For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that man. What does that mean? That means Adam sinned, and because Adam sinned, everybody from Adam, after Adam, you and me, we all sin. And because of that, our sin deserves death and judgment. God is a holy, holy, holy God. He is holy and righteous and good, and he calls us to live according to the, the perfect standard of his righteousness. But because of our sin, inherited from Adam, we fall short of that, and we deserve judgment. We deserve hell. We deserve his wrath because of our sin against the infinitely holy God. So when Paul says, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. That means that unless something is done about our sin, death reigns in us. We will die physically, and if we, our sin is not forgiven and we're declared righteous, like what happened to Michael, then we'll not only die physically, but we'll die eternally and suffer God's judgment in hell. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, listen, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So he, Paul says, Adam sinned because Adam sinned, you sin. And you can't really blame it on Adam because you'd have done it too, but you also choose to sin because that's your nature. You choose to sin. You deserve death. But Jesus came with grace the abundance of grace. And he offers a free gift of righteousness. How did he do that? Jesus came and he said, I know there's no way you can save yourself. You are prone to sin. You deserve judgment and wrath. But I am perfectly righteous, Jesus says. He is perfectly righteous. He, ha he, he is the definition of righteousness. He knows no sin. In him there is no sin because he is God. He, is, he defines what is right and good. And he came on this earth. God came in the flesh, and he lived a perfect life on this earth, perfectly obedient to God's law, perfectly righteous, the righteousness you and I need. And when he hung on Calvary's cross, what did he do? He was taking your sin on himself. The, body, the, the Bible says that he bore our sins in his body on the tree, and God was pouring out his wrath and judgment on Jesus on the cross completely pouring it out. It was completely paid for. Jesus said right before he died, he said, it is finished. And then on the third day, God raised him from the dead. God had approved of the sacrifice of Christ to fully pay for our sin. The payment's been completely made. So it says, 
For if because of one man's trespass, that's Adam, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace, you didn't deserve what Jesus did, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So what does Jesus offer us? He says, if you trust in me, if you turn from your sin, if you hate it, if you despise it, if you want it forgiven, if you want to turn away from it, and you want to be a follower of Christ, and you trust fully and completely, not in anything you can do, but fully and completely in what Christ did on the cross as full payment for your sin, then what God does, the Scripture teaches, is that He forgives you all your sin, and He declares you righteous, and He gives you, as a free gift, the righteousness of Jesus, through which God sees you now. It's not anything you earned. It's what Christ gave you. Righteousness has been credited to your account. And now, instead of eternal death and judgment, those who are saved, like we've seen today, have life, eternal life after we die. And that comes only through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, what Jesus did, leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man, that's Jesus' obedience, the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, So the law came, God's law came and showed us we were sinners, and we realized, whoa, we're big sinners because we really break this law. We don't fulfill God's perfect standard of righteousness. Now, when the law came in, now the law came in to increase the trespass, listen, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. What does that say? That says that no matter what, no matter how much you sin, you can't out the grace of God. That means that nobody can say, I'm too bad of a sinner for Christ to save because you may have been the worst sinner. Paul killed people. He killed Christians, but God came and saved him. God's grace abounds greater than your greatest sin. There's no reason for anybody not to come to Christ. So we're justified. We're made right with God through our faith in what Jesus did. For our salvation. This gospel that I just shared with you is the same message that brings salvation to you, to me, to Philip, to Stephen, to Saul, to the Samarian, Samaritans, later in chapter 8 of Acts, to the Ethiopian official that's riding in a cart and Philip, a uh, chariot, and Philip comes up and shares the gospel with them, and the Ethiopian gets saved and baptized. It's the same gospel that brought salvation in Philippi to Lydia, to, for the, you know, we've just studied Philippians, to Iodia and Syntyche and the Philippian jailer. The same gospel that brings salvation to tax collectors and fishermen and Jews and Gentiles and slaves and freedmen, the poor, the rich, society's elite. And society's dregs, people from every ethnic group, race, and nation, no matter who we meet, what they need most is the gospel, and they need Christ proclaimed to them from you and me. So share the gospel with them. Don't change it. Don't change the gospel. Don't take away from the gospel. Don't add to it to make it more acceptable. Be bold in your declaration of the gospel in all its fullness, no matter if it brings persecution. You know why Stephen was, was, uh, was stoned to death and, perse- and, and executed? Because he was bold in calling out the sin of those who crucified Christ. He called them a, root, a brood of vipers, and he let them see how, how wretched they were in their sin. And because he was that bold... He got killed, and persecution came to the church in Jerusalem, and it scattered them. So what might, in our little human logic mind, say, hmm, how can we best reach our community? Let's just kind of change the gospel a bit so our community loves us, and we don't say things that they don't like to hear. We don't tell them that they are 
sinners in need of a, a Savior, and we're not declaring the bold truth for them because they might not accept it, and they might not like us, and they might persecute us. And What if, what if Stephen would have done that? Stephen said, no, I will proclaim the truth. Even if it brought what it brought. Don't change the gospel. Share the gospel in all its fullness. Don't let human reasoning lead you to unfaithfulness in your declaration. It is not a success, ultimately, if our community likes us. We want our community to like us. It is a success if our community has heard the truth of the gospel from us and then is loved by us. The gospel of Jesus in full is the only remedy for the sinner. And then I just want you to see before we close that God's mission will not fail. It won't fail. Remember, Acts 1.8, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Here it is. The went to Samaria. It didn't fail. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Samaria, verse 14 says, had received the word of God. Persecution didn't stop the spread of the gospel, the fulfillment of God's great commission, but in fact, it fueled it. Warren Wearsby says, persecution does to the church what wind does to seed. It scatters it and only produces a greater harvest. McLaren says, the violent hand of the persecutor acted as the scattering hand of the sower. It flung the seeds broadcast, and wherever they fell, they sprouted. Tony Merida says, the enemies of the church tried to kill the message and messengers of Jesus, but God used their evil for good for the salvation of many. That reminds us of the story of Joseph. You remember? He was sold into slavery, but ended up being able to save his family and his people because of what all that God did and the path that put him on. And he even says, what, brothers, you meant for evil, God meant for good. And then the ultimate, you meant for evil, but God meant it for good, was Jesus the religious leaders hated him, and in their evil, they killed him. But through his death, God provided for our salvation. Through the persecution of these believers, God provided for the salvation of many. So, here's what we think in our cozy little America that we live in. We think that we need no opposition, no persecution. We think we need religious freedom. All these are good. I'm not saying these are bad, but this, we think we need that. We think we need no opposition, no persecution, religious freedom, and plenty of resources for God to build his church most effectively. That's what we think we need. Certainly, he can build his church in those conditions, and he has. But here's my question. We've had religious freedom, relatively little opposition, and plenty of resources, but has that made us work harder to share the gospel, or has it made us apathetic and distracted with selfish pursuits and our freedom and our affluence? Are we maximizing the gifts of grace, of freedom, and no opposition to share the gospel, or are we just being comfortable in them for selfish reasons? We certainly don't want persecution. No, no, no. We don't want opposition. But even if, when it comes, God will build his church. Matthew 16, 18, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Sometimes persecution is how he builds his church. Just ask other countries. Nothing's going to stop God from building his church. And when we join his mission... We are joining a mission that will not fail. So let's get consumed with the gospel of our Savior and sharing it with others. Here's my question to you before I give you just a few applications. What are you consumed with? These believers, no matter where they went, they were consumed with sharing the gospel. What are you and I consumed with? I know what we're consumed with. I battle it all the time, too. We're consumed with social media. We're consumed with what we promote on social media, with what we consume on social media. Why in the world do we feel the need to 
scroll all the time. There are way too many memes and reels and stories and comments and rabbit hole conversations that we get consumed with that is stealing our passion and our energy to go out and get our eyes on other people and not on our phone and share the gospel with people. We're consumed with making money. We're consumed with living comfortable lives. We're consumed with racking up lists of enjoyable earthly experiences, some call bucket lists. We're consumed with fitness and health. One now that's just all over the place, we're consumed with self-esteem. I just got to make myself feel good. It's all about me. I just got to make sure I'm healthy and all that. We're consumed these days, in these days of division, to be up to date on every political wind that blows. We got to know every move the president makes or every move that our political opponent makes so we can hate him even more. We're consumed with writing social wrongs. Now, I'm not saying at all that there is not value in some of those things to some degree. Not at all. Social media can be used for good. Being aware of what's going on in the world can be good. A lot of these things can be good in their place. However, these things should never consume us to the point that they replace our consuming passion in all and above all to daily fulfill the Great Commission. So are you consumed with fulfilling the Great Commission? Consumed with mission to all people, we share the gospel of Christ. God's mission won't fail. So, three quick reasons to be consumed with sharing the gospel with the lost. Number one, your Lord, your Savior commanded it. Number two, the spiritual state of unbelievers and believers. Every unbeliever, if they die without Christ, will go to hell. Every unbeliever, I mean every believer who dies with Christ will go to forever joy and blessing in heaven and forever and eternal life with God. Why in the world would we not say, come go there? This weekend, I celebrated, just this weekend, birthdays, I took part in a funeral and a baptism. And here's the truth. Everybody's born and has a birthday. Everybody's going to die and probably have a funeral. The question is, will everybody pass through the waters of baptism because they've been saved so after they die, they go to be with Jesus? Does the reality of the sinner's state and, the, and the, the state of the saints, believers, call us to the mission? Sure it does. And the third reason to be consumed with sharing the gospel is that so God can be glorified. God deserves the glory from everybody on this planet, not sin and earthly things. So I'm going to give you some action steps and then I'm done. Here's what I, we as a church are calling you and I, us, to do. Identify one lost person that does not know Jesus and pray for their salvation every day, multiple times a day. And pray for God to use you to bring the gospel to them. And I'm going to challenge you to do something even bigger and bolder, maybe even today around those tables we're going to be at. I want you to share that name. We want you to share that name of that person with a Christian friend in this church that will hold you accountable to asking, hey, how's it going? Are you doing it? Look for ways to connect with that one person. Build relationship with them and be intentional. And in your interaction with them, look for ways to share the gospel and do it.
That means you're going to have to change your schedule. You're going to have to say, hey, I might need to invite them over to my house, or I might need to ask them out to lunch, or I might need to get involved with something they're involved with so I can have interaction with them, so I can have opportunities to share the gospel with them. And you might have to get your eyes off of yourself and your schedule and your little rut of the life that you've gotten into. I have it too. And we have to get out of that and say, hey, let me get into other people's lives so I can share the gospel with them. Out in the, at each exit, there are tracks, gospel tracks. These are the three that I recommend the most. most. What is the gospel? Ten reasons Jesus came to die. And then one for children called the biggest story. I challenge you to take some tracks today. Take three. Let's go for that. Take three. And then look for opportunities just to say, hey, best news ever. Changed my life. And hand it to somebody. It's easy to do when you're at a drive through it's easy to do when you get a conversation with a repairman that comes to your home. Look for opportunities to just give the gospel out. Stephen Cole tells the story of a Chinese missionary who was uh, doing some, you know, he, he was like an eye doctor and he removed the cataracts from one Chinese farmer's eyes and then he could see better. Well, after that, he looked out his office window one day, and here was this farmer holding this end of a rope, and hanging on to each, to this rope, were dozens of blind Chinese people coming to the man that helped him see. And the picture is this, your eyes have been opened to the gospel. Our job is to bring blind people to Christ. Are, are we letting blind people just fumble around trying to find their way in the darkness on their way to hell around us while we enjoy our sight I made the mistake and read a Spurgeon sermon Spurgeon says this these persecuted ones in Acts chapter 8 went everywhere preaching the word why was it so natural to them to do it their obligations pressed upon them they each one of them said, I have been saved and I must see others saved. I am bound to tell the, of the blood of Jesus and its power to wash away sin. The curses of the ages will fall upon me and the wails of lost souls will come up into my ears as long as I exist if I do not make known the gospel. Brethren, God's way of saving the unconverted is through his church. And if the church neglects, it, neglects its work, who is to do it? If you do not tell the gospel, you are leaving your fellow men to perish. Yonder is the wreck, and you are not sending out a lifeboat. Yonder are souls starving, and you give them no bread. End quote. We know what we should be doing. So let's finally do something about it like we never have. What are you going to be remembered by? A full bucket list? A life of social revolution, your political views, great business, wonderful family man or woman? Or are you going to be known as that believer who loved Jesus so much that we couldn't stop talking about him? How will they know if we don't tell them? God, Help us to be a church. Help me to be a Christian. And us to be a church that can't get Jesus and his gospel off of our lips. That we don't mind being that Christian that's always talking about Jesus. Because one day... One day, we're going to wish that we shared Jesus more. So God, help us to put into practice what we know we should be doing and what you have commanded us to do out of love for you and out of love for the lost. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.